Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It is Tuesday, 17th of November. Going to have a quick run through then of the overnight news, how we close on Wall Street, a couple of things to be aware of for the session ahead from a fundamental perspective. And so starting as usual with the overall cross asset class mix for this morning and overall fairly quiet. Um, we had a positive close on Wall Street last night. Uh, the S&P up around 1.2, Dow 1.6, the Nasdaq a slight laggard uh, up 0.6%. The Russell 2000 though, of US small cap stocks often seen as a bit of a barometer for the domestic economy uh, did close at a record high. Uh, obviously then this all coming on the back of what had been a continuation uh, of a similar theme to this time last week, which was more positive vaccine news this time coming out of the firm Moderna. Uh, you kind of know this already. I did put out a video at the time when it came out, but the main takeaway point here being uh, that the vaccine can be stored at refrigerated temperatures for at least 30 days. It's much longer uh, than Pfizer, their counterpart, and dip, deep freeze issue that was really one of the main barriers for Pfizer, which is about ultra cold temperatures at minus 70 degrees Celsius. That is not the case for this Moderna vaccine. So uh, much more easier in terms of the potential significant logistical issues that would have been uh, present for the likes of Pfizer. So that was a net positive uh, for markets. And overall then the kind of heat map at the close, uh, a little bit reflective of the fact that energy and financial stocks led the gains both sides of the Atlantic. Um, travel stocks also benefited as that we saw uh, this time last week uh, with the biggest uh, kind of movement coming in some of the US airline stocks which were up four to five percent. Cruise liners also gaining and the NASDAQ underperforming. So kind of a soft version of that rotation that people were talking about. A um, couple of things though that I'd like to stress really twofold about why I think that this move is a little bit different from the move we had last week. Already, largely what you've seen here reflected on the charts, and this is kind of point one, which is in a top right hand corner here in gold, you can see a big downward move when the news broke, and then we reversed it within the course of about two hours or so. If we look at other products, the US 10 year dropped, reversed most of the move within the same sort of time frame. Uh, and so some of the things here, point one is the behavioral element and what I mean by that is the fact that generally when news comes out, the first time a specific piece of news comes out on a subject, uh, it obviously has the most impact on us because we don't really have much of a reference point. And the Pfizer one really did come as a bit of a surprise. We knew that updates were going to be pending given that they were in phase three of clinical trials, but we didn't know exactly when or to what degree how positive the data was going to be. Now the kind of cat is out of the bag and Pfizer's come out and front run almost some of these latest updates. The Moderna one had some bang when it came out, but very short lived in some respects. The second point then of why the moves are fairly more contained than they were before is don't forget there's also, you know, a vaccine is kind of a medium long term uh, idea about obviously securing then a more solid economic recovery, alleviating concerns. Uh, the quicker you can get it in, obviously, the better, both from a humanitarian point of view, but also from an economic and markets perspective. However, there is a really bad COVID development going on at the moment in North America, in the US, and that's requiring lots of different shutdowns now on the state level. And so for me, this idea of rotation, I think kind of similar to what I was saying at the time of, the, uh, of last week, I think it's a little overdone. Uh, I think that's what's controlling a lot of these moves. Remember, the airline stocks outperformed yesterday were up kind of 4 to 5%. They were up more like 20% when the Pfizer news came out. So I think the reality is a little bit more baked in as people become a little bit more educated about these viruses, I would say, uh, is, is, is one point. But also the fact that if the pandemic gets worse, well, the love for these tech stocks isn't going away anytime soon. And so the rotation is much more mild, I, I think, for the time being, because we've got to get through, obviously, uh, the next probably Q4, Q, Q1, at least, uh, if not further, into Q2, into the second half of next year, before then really you see a, a, a real maybe tangible commitment by big fund managers to start rotating out of some of these, these tech uh, names at this point. So, yeah, just thought I would, I'd point this out. But otherwise, a quick look at the other sectors and, you know, what's going on at the moment. In the FX markets, uh, the dollar 
fairly flat, albeit coming off its lowest bound levels in the overnight Asia pack session, just, just firming up a touch as European players come in. So both cable and euro dollar just coming off their highs. Near term technical levels, uh, euro dollar just coming off the initial high that we printed really around this time yesterday, which was around 118.73 and a half in the futures. So uh, the nearest and clearest point of resistance down that double top. Pretty similar case here for cable as well. Uh, I can see a rectangle I had on so some of the resistance areas from, from yesterday still playing true at the moment, which was uh, the cap of the Asia Pacific session as we were going in from Wednesday into Thursday night. It's capped also the price activity uh, yesterday and this morning. So a fairly substantial uh, area now of resistance uh, for the upside for any cable appreciations if we were to see them throughout the day, as you can see there. In other asset classes, uh, the NASDAQ still kind of uh, conforming to what had been uh, a key area of resistance that I was watching yesterday, which the market had responded to, um, that being up at around the high that we had from uh, Monday early morning futures trade at the reopening of Globex trade this week uh, on uh, the initial pop through of some of this range trade that we were trading at the time. Uh, then also, we've got the movement from the top of the uh, pre just before Pfizer news uh, spike on the 9th. So last week, Monday to then the Tuesday low and the Fib retracement on the 618. It comes in at around that level that restricted the price action from yesterday as the, as the high in the futures. So that's still a bit of a near term barrier. Um, any break above there at any point, I'd be looking in terms of the intraday today. The R1s are quite interesting area. Uh, you can see here close proximity to the intraday high, got the R1, and you've also got these previous areas of here, the resistance that we had on the high on the 5th, going into the 6th, and also the closing of um, that prior week uh, as well, going from the reopening of trade on the 9th. Um, otherwise, in the oil markets, uh, that is fairly quiet ahead of the uh, meeting today of OPEC Alliance. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment, but we're trading around pivot at the moment, just drifting a little lower uh, as Europe has come in. And in the fixed income space, basically trading flat at the moment. All right, so let's get stuck into some of the headlines and talk about what's been going on uh, from, a, from an overall perspective. And, and starting with this idea about US COVID and what's going to go on. Uh, Joe Biden, the president-elect, did speak yesterday. Uh, he was talking about the fact that, look, Trump's got to play ball and work with the new incoming administration in order to, to deal with this coronavirus pandemic. Nothing really particularly uh, specific um, in regards to plans that, let's say, Biden had. But if you remember, something which was already being adopted as a strategy from, from the Trump era uh, was that of putting the onus on local state governors to take action on any types of uh, restrictions that were being imparted. If you remember, that was a good way for Trump to kind of disassociate himself from any COVID fallout, because then it wasn't a national-led uh, kind of coming from the administration uh, policies. It was coming from an individual state level, which does, to a certain degree, make a lot of sense, because on the ground, if you think geo in terms of the geography of America, uh, whether it's the Midwest, which is being impacted now, or it's the Tri-State or the Sun Belt, they're all very different in terms of their economic makeup and also their geographic kind of temperate weather, which can have an influence over the performance of the virus. So here then, what's happening is we've been waiting for quite a while and numbers have been accelerating quite dramatically in America. And you know, if I show you what that chart looks like, the seven-day average which is the green line, has consistently been moving higher and is now in excess of 150,000 cases per day. Uh, and obviously that uh, death toll has been edging up. It's approximately half of what it was back in the initial spring uh, outbreak in the initial first wave. However, the fact that these numbers are so high now would then indicate that the death toll will match what we saw back early in this year in kind of March, April time, given the three week lag we tend to see. Now, the spread is becoming more further and wide. Um, as you can see from here, you remember during the election, really the deepest red was contained uh, up in the Midwest kind of area, um, but it's gradually started to filter out through kind of central to east 
coast and going from north to south. Um, that has led then to a number of actions taking place, and this is what I can update you on. Uh, the governor of California said he was activating what he calls an emergency break and applying tougher coronavirus restrictions to large parts of the state in an effort to contain the surge of infections. This, of course, and an important thing here, does come ahead of Thanksgiving holiday at the end of the month. I did see some surveys doing the rounds yesterday, and it was asking uh, the US public about whether they're going to adhere to kind of limited numbers of people gathering, the social distancing, these sorts of things over Thanksgiving. And as you would imagine, it's a shockingly high number of people that said that they would not adhere to those types of restrictions. So I think all of these governors are very mindful of Thanksgiving. Uh, traditionally, then, one of the biggest holidays, of course, in the US calendar, and one of which normally a lot of people get together to, to celebrate. And so they're taking preemptive measures, I'd say. Uh, and California, of course, is particularly important given the fact that economically it's such a large contribution to, to US growth overall and the fact now that they're starting to go back into a more restrictive environment is going to have to then um, be reflected in the economic recovery that we've been seeing in the US. So not only are high frequency, more real-time data points starting to reflect quite a significant downturn in overall broader activity in the economy that's only going to be accelerated now by the um, implementation of further restrictions that's going to happen uh, a lot of this then has led to the idea of uh, what i thought was quite interesting i saw a comment from steve englander uh, you might not have heard of that chap before but he's basically the head of north american um, macro and fx strategy at standard chartered and he said that he believes the fed the federal reserve may surprise markets by increasing its asset purchases to $120 billion a month before the December meeting, if it appears that rising COVID-19 cases are weighing on the economy. Now, if you think about the domino effect here, case rise, restrictions come in, that impedes economic then uh, activity, which then makes the downturn or recovery uh, more severe, and therefore the Fed might want to take more preemptive action to get ahead of it rather than waiting until the middle of, middle of December, which is when their next meeting is. So I thought that was quite interesting. Definitely that would be another shot in the arm to fire up markets and you would expect equities to probably rally again quite aggressively because don't forget we have a lack of fiscal stimulus right now. And obviously as, as, as companies and and so forth start to struggle, particularly in the hospitality, leisure sectors, things that have been impacted very, very significantly before, people are going to lose jobs. And so therefore, do the Fed feel the need to really step in? And if they do, I'm sure markets would breathe another fairly significant sigh of relief if that were the case. So just something to perhaps keep an eye on. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but we've got almost a month to run till the Fed meeting. And uh, that death toll should mathematically start to pick up pretty rapid over the course of the next fortnight. And so therefore, could we see Fed intervention in, in about two weeks' time? I think quite an interesting prospect to bring about. Um, the other thing here is then other areas. Uh, citing the rising number of cases, Philadelphia, which is the largest city in Pennsylvania, said yesterday that it will ban indoor dining as well as indoor gatherings and events involving people from different households from November 20th through to the new year. Uh, the state of New Jersey yesterday reduced the number of people allowed to gather indoors from 25 to 10. And starting today, Washington state will enforce a number of restrictions for a period of a month, including shutting down indoor service at bars, restaurants, gyms, limiting gatherings from people from different households as well. So we're starting to see the first kind of emergence of more definitive action being taken now uh, across the US. And I would expect this to continue. Uh, the interesting prospect now is, uh, I, I think the Fed are a little bit far away from making that more um, interventionist kind of approach. I don't think it's quite warranted just yet, but seemingly a, a lack of anywhere near getting a compromise on Capitol Hill, given how far apart uh, the Dem Democratic and the Republican Party are at 2.4-ish trillion and 500 billion. That's not coming soon either. So although equities have been moving up very positively in knee-jerk reaction to vaccine information, 
I think that there's a risk that things could turn a little bit more sour, uh, given how far we've we've run up quite recently, particularly in the equity markets. Uh, so yeah, a few things to think about on that side of things. All right, elsewhere, OPEC. We do have the OPEC meeting today. They had some uh, telephone conversations yesterday. Uh, the Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee, the JMMC, meets. Uh, and it's suggested by a technical panel in an article on Bloomberg yesterday uh, that they have advised the ministers of OPEC Plus Oil Alliance should consider delaying its planned output boost by three to six months. Uh, the official 23 nation alliance won't make its final decision now until November 30th, December 1st meeting, uh, which will be held in around two weeks time. So again, if you hear any headlines, tweets, these sorts of things, three to six months is pretty much baked in. Uh, anything longer than that, nine, 12 months, obviously the longer, the lesser probability of that happening, but the more bullish of price that would be if that was to materialize. Other things then, Tesla, I'm sure you read this last night, um, but the, the S&P index has finally bowed over to the fact that, look, you've got to include Tesla now. You know, it's a multi uh, hundred billion dollar um, company. It's got to be represented in one of the world's uh, most significant and largest inde indexes of the biggest companies. And so um, I don't know if you saw this last night, but Tesla shares were up after the closing bell about 13, just over 13 uh, percent. And it came on the back of the fact that Tesla will enter the S&P 500 little Christmas present for Elon on December 21st. Uh, it will be one of the index's most influential constituents. I was having a look at the actual list of the S&P 500 companies by index weighting. Uh, and actually, it jumps in there with the likes of Berkshire Hathaway, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, which, which take up kind of the 7th, 8th and ninth spots in the S&P top 10. And Tesla's going to slip right in there, straight into the top 10. Never has it been seen before of a company going in at such magnitude into the index. Now, their shares were obviously up yesterday. They were up after market. Uh, the, the, the membership or inclusion within the index comes with a host of different benefits for the company, including forced purchases to buy index tracking investors and mutual funds. If you think about those with representation then of S&P exposure, given the fact now that such a large proportion of that is going to be taken by Tesla, well, they've got to start buying into Tesla then to have an equal amount of representation of that index. So um, one of the upsides here for that stock, but quite quite meaningful story there on a single stock basis. The other thing is Brexit. I've read a couple of things this morning I thought were quite interesting. Uh, from a top level perspective, Bloomberg have put out their latest uh, analyst poll and cable they say may fall to 125 by the middle of next year according to nine different bank strategists. Uh, what does that look like? Well, here's a chart to kind of encapsulate a little bit of the, the, the Brexit saga going back to the referendum in the summer of 2016 through to Johnson winning the election, the first lockdown and, and where we're trading at the moment. Uh, so you can see we are relatively high here comparative to where we were back in the depths of the initial first wave of the pandemic. And a lot of that obviously has been supported by at the time what was a ultimately weakening dollar more than overall sterling strength. But there comes then the decision as we go into year end. I must stress though, as much as the strategists are saying there could be a 5% downward risk uh, to a no deal materializing by the end of the year. They do go on to stress though that the base case scenario by a probability of 70% is still some form of agreement by the end of the year. And that certainly for Amplify here is where our expectations do lie. Uh, for that to come to pass, the currency on balance from the nine strategists they say could rise by approximately two and a half percent. Uh, which would be up to around 135. So remember, the upside relief would be half the size as the downside shock. And that's because on the balance, expectations are that a deal will be brokered. And hence then the upside is, is much more uh, lesser significant. Um, on the Brexit side, a couple of things I did see that I do think are worth talking about. Um, the UK chief Brexit negotiator, David Frost, told Johnson, the PM, to expect a Brussels trade agreement early next week. That was according to The Sun. An EU diplomat also suggested the EU is ready to find a creative solution to avoid an accidental no-deal Brexit, according to The Telegraph. 
Um, and then the final one, this coming out, um, I think this was in The Guardian, separate report suggested that under emergency plans, an EU Parliament vote on a Brexit trade deal could be delayed until December, wait for it, the 28th, rather than the currently scheduled December 16th. So you remember that timeline that I shared with you before? So uh, to refresh your memories, this is what that timeline looks like because I did tweet it. So here's all like the main dates to be aware of. And there's a European Parliament meeting happening on 14th to the 17th of December. Um, and you remember what I've kind of been alluding to for some time is that, look, just because these dates suggest are fixed here, that does not mean, and I'm using the whole four years of precedence to make this kind of assumption, that does not mean they cannot have emergency meetings and summits uh, at any point given what would be highly accelerated talks going this close to the wire into the deadline. And so for me, hearing that in The Guardian kind of just ultimately just solidifies it in my head. This thing's going all the way down, isn't it? You know, David uh, Frost saying that he's going to have um, a deal by the early next week. Yeah, you're, no, you're not, I'm afraid. You're, that, why would you do that? I just don't see any point at this, at this time. The other thing I think that's interesting is the fact that those EU diplomats are talking about finding a creative solution to avoid a disruptive no-deal Brexit. I think that is logic. Um, it's not in Europe's or UK's interest, given the compounded difficulties experienced from COVID, to make Brexit actually a tangible, real risk. So as much as I think that if we do go down to the wire, Sterling's got to price in a little bit of uh, increased no-deal risk, but ultimately I think a deal gets struck. Um, and so that deal could well come um, in that period just before the new year. It would not surprise me at all. Okay, final thing then, looking at Canada for today. Really quiet in terms of UK European morning. Uh, just US retail sales coming out this afternoon was probably a main focal point. But as I said yesterday in the weekly outlook, this is October data for US retail sales. And so it's quite backward looking. And if you think about now what I've just described that is happening on a state level with restrictions to control COVID-19 in America, it's what the future retail sales numbers look like in November and December that's going to be critical. October is yesterday's chip paper, I'm afraid. And so I don't really see much ability for this number to really move markets a great deal. I think one thing that could be quite interesting is this number is expected at plus 0.5%. Last month was 1.9%, which was quite a bit higher than expected at that time of release four weeks ago. If today's number is much weaker than expected and we're anticipating it to get much worse again, that could be quite interesting. But it's got to be a quite outlier in a negative sense then to accelerate this idea of uh, a US slowdown. Otherwise, in the afternoon, you've got Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey speaking again. Um, he's spoken pretty much every day uh, for the last week and a half or so. So uh, there's little risk associated with him actually saying something, I would say. Same case with Christine Lagarde, who speaks, you remember, um, yesterday, today. I think she takes a break on Wednesday, hits it again Thursday, Friday. So she's speaking pretty much all week. The more she speaks, it's kind of a um, a dual purpose kind of strategy, I guess. Um, one of the main things being that she just wants to um, strategically be positioned where she's always present, she's always communicating, therefore the markets can be assured uh, because all the time she can be kind of paying heed to the fact that the developments that are happening in markets, which gives markets more uh, confidence that she's on top of the situation and we don't need to guess, we know what she's thinking. And that's a positive strategy in regards to traditional central banking kind of tactics. Uh, the other thing, though, from a trading point of view, though, is that it means it becomes relatively dull what she says because you hear from her so often, you, you know what she's saying, and it doesn't really, you don't get these dramatic shifts uh, in policy hints or thinking because you hear from her so often. So it kind of diminishes the impact from an intraday day trading environment. But definitely, as I always say, it's worth keeping an ear out when the likes of Lagarde or Bailey or Powell speak, for sure. Even though our probabilities are, our expectations are very low that they'll say something market moving, they of course do have the propensity to do so. Um, you do have Dave Ramsden um, also speaking, fairly interesting character and obviously fairly aligned at the top with Bailey. 
um, in terms of his position. So worth keeping an eye out at sort of 5 p.m. London time. But pretty quiet overall, I'd say, from a, a, um, an overall perspective. Even though retail sales and industrial production, manufacturing production, cap utilization would be normally quite important uh, collection of data, uh, I think in the context it's been um, kind of played down a little bit given what's going on. All right, that is it. I'm not going to talk any more. Any questions, of course, I'll see everyone in, in uh, the live chat room on Amplify Live. Otherwise, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave a comment below. Happy to uh, help if I can. All right, guys, have a good day ahead.